Uh, so it's Tuesday. You have homework seven due on Thursday, 48 hours. I will have office hours after class today right here. So you can just hang out here for a full three hours this morning if you're so inclined and work on stuff. Um, so office hours today from 9.45 to 11.45 here in this room. And then uh, I'll also be having some office hours tomorrow afternoon. I think maybe like 1 to 2 is what I said uh, over in Farrell. That's the story. Questions about the plan? All right, we're learning about fractals. So we have these cool pictures that you get to make just by moving your cursor around. That's pretty awesome. Uh, we're trying to understand what these pictures mean. And the goal for today will be to really nail down um, how these images are being generated. There'll be some MATLAB code on the web for you to generate these images yourself uh, for specific C values. Um, you can also obviously take screenshots of, of what you find on this website. Um, Okay, so we finished, we finished off our discussion last time. We were talking about Julia sets and trying to think about what the properties of these sets are. In the pictures, again, these are the boundaries between points that are headed to infinity and points that are um, headed into some sink. It's the boundary between those two similar to the stable manifold of a saddle in previous discussions of other things. Um, okay, so, so what did we say about this? Well, we have this, uh, this equation, P sub C of Z. It's a polynomial with one parameter C, um, taking as an argument a complex number. This is Z squared plus C. This is the equation that we're iterating for different values of C. And you know, as I move my cursor around the board, I'm inserting into this equation a particular parameter value c. And then what's being plotted is the colors are the rate at which each of those points in the complex plane for that value of c heads off to infinity. And if the points are white in the picture, they, they don't go to infinity. They go to some sink. So we're going to try and describe that well today. Um, we did a few examples by hand last time. And on your homework, you're going to be asked to, to use a piece of MATLAB code to make these Julia set pictures for, a, I think, just four C values. It shouldn't be too difficult. Um, the question of how the, how the computer does this, that's, that's part of your homework assignment, is trying to figure out like, how, do, how are these pictures actually made. Um, it's not trivial to calculate these Julia sets because if you think about what's happening, uh, Points that are near them go away from them. Because if you're near this Julia set, you're getting some color that is how quickly you either go to infinity, or if you're a white point, you're headed away from the Julia set to go to some um, low dimensional potentially sink. White points are in the basin of some sink. So you don't actually, by you know, dropping down a bunch of points and iterating them forward, you don't actually see what this Julia set looks like. Um, yeah. So in the picture that, you know, that we're looking at here, you don't actually have to find them. You can just color points based on what they do, and then it's the, you know, your eye picks up what this boundary looks like. But, um, OK, so some things that we, we're going to write down some properties of these Julia sets um, just to kind of get our intuition going about them. Uh, so a few things to say. The Julia set, uh, we called it J last time. And it's the boundary between points going to infinity or to some sink. So J is invariant, which means that if I am a point on this boundary, I don't eventually iterate to being a point that goes to infinity or a point that goes to the sink. I'm always on the boundary from point to point as I go. Again, similar to what our manifold, stable manifold of a saddle was like. If I was on that manifold, I, I stayed. So J is invariant. Which, you know, so we can write this down mathematically, i.e., if z0, um, some initial value, is a member of j, so is p sub c of z0, which we would call z1, and z2, and z3, and so on. So if I can find a point on the Julia set, 
then I can bounce around forward or backwards orbit of that point, and that's going to take me to other points on the Julia set. That would be one way to find out what the orbit, what the actual set looks like, if I can stay on it. Um, if it's really sensitive, then I might hop on the computer off of the, the set, and then it would, that would make it harder to, uh, to see. Questions about that property? So if I'm on the boundary, I stay on the boundary. That's the idea there. Cool. Um, orbits in J are either periodic sources Uh, eventually periodic to periodic sources or chaotic. We've defined chaos in one dimension for one dimensional maps and this is a, um, a thing we'll, we'll move towards sort of end of next week talking about chaos in higher dimensions than one. That's coming. Um, all right, but orbits in J, we, we've seen a f the, the ones that we did by hand. Let's see. So we had when C was minus I, uh, we started at the origin. We kind of bounced around, and it was the origin in that case was eventually periodic to, um, to a period two uh, orbit. So we said, what did we say? That, you know, when C was like, I'm freak out. I see we're somewhere around here. Um, the origin was EP to a source, a period two source. So that that um, that source was a component of J. It wasn't all of J. There can also be chaotic orbits, which we'll define um, more formally soon. And and then that's it. There's you know the the if there is a sink, remember the origin has to go to it. The origin's the only critical point. Um, so in the event that you take the origin and map it and it doesn't go to a sink, maybe it goes to infinity, maybe it goes to J, that tells you something about whether the sink exists. And the Mandelbrot set is going to be a, a distillation of what the origin does for all of these different C values. Questions about this? Yeah? If you iterated it and from zero, yeah. and how would you know you were on J? And yeah. Just on Good, yeah. So I'll, we'll get to that. Um, if it goes to a sink, you know that it's not in J. The origin is not a member of J because J is the boundary of the sink and the, and the, infinity, you know, the basin of the sink and the basin of infinity. Um, if the origin goes to infinity, you know it's not in J. And if it is eventually periodic to a source, you know that it, it is in J. Um, There's only one other thing here, and that would be that it's chaotic. The origin's chaotic, um, and that, that could happen too. And you, we, we'll be able to quantify all those things well. It won't, we won't be uncertainty about it. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah? I think that the z squared plus some numbers yeah. the origin and not on that graph as soon as that number is to zero. Good. So when the, what, you'll remember that when we fir the first thing we did was when c was zero, we decided that the origin was a sink, and everything inside the unit circle went to it. But when c is not zero, the origin stops being a fixed point because you plug in zero, you square, you get zero. You add c, you're not at zero anymore. So zero um, isn't going to be attracting or repelling things. It's going somewhere. And we're going to quantify well where is the origin going. The origin matters so much in that question because, because it's the, the only critical point of this map. And according to this theorem, the a sink needs to attract at least one critical point. So if a critical point exists, the origin, if the sink exists, it, in this case it does here, then the origin has to end up going to it. So it'll approach, you know, no matter what we um, provided there is a sink to go to, the origin will, uh, will eventually approach it. We're going to play around with this. It's going to be fun. Cool. Uh, all right, more, more things to say about this set J. The set J is really weird, but we're going to write down things we know about it, and it'll kind of... Um, Iron itself out. All unstable 
periodic points of this polynomial P sub C are in this boundary J. So we know if the origin goes to, the, the only way there can be a sink is that the origin goes to it. Um, if there are any sources, period two source, like the example for C equals minus I, if there are any sources, those sources are in J. Um, they can't be in sinks, it, the, the, in, in the only sink, and they can't go to infinity. So that the only thing left for them to do is to be in J if there are, uh, are sources. Uh, J is either totally connected or totally disconnected. Um, so in, in one dimensions, in 1D, in one dimension, this would be uh, intervals or dust. It's a little slightly different in two dimensions. But the idea is, um, you know, when I look at this curve and I see, oh, well, it, you know, for, the, for a C value of 0, you know, this boundary set is the unit circle. That's obviously a connected set. If I put my pencil down and I try and draw the unit circle, I can do it. Um, so that's J. The unit circle is, is J for this particular C value. And then if I take my C value and I do something, you know, over here where the origin goes to infinity, um, the set J, that is the points that remain bounded, is completely disconnected. It's a dust. If I put my pencil down on any point that stays and doesn't go to infinity, of which there are some, you can't really make them out. But if I put those, my point down on one of them, I can't draw a continuous curve to another, like I could a second ago. So, um, in fact, the, so let's see, uh, if I look at what the Mandelbrot set looks like, um, we're going to work our way to understanding this, but the black points here are points for which the origin's bounded in the Julia set. These are C values, if I put my cursor down here, it's a C value for which the origin's bounded. And if I come out here, it's a C value for which the origin's unbounded. Those, those are two examples we just did the Julia set for. I, I put my cursor in here, the origin was bounded, J was completely connected. I moved it outside and J was a dust, it had shattered and was completely disconnected. Uh, and so interestingly, this boundary of, the boundary of the Mandelbrot set are going to be C values for which J is is just this sort of, um, it doesn't contain anything. So the C value of minus i, for example, down here, is one such place where the Julia sets, if we look at them for, for points along the boundary, you think about the area of this white basin of a sink, that area is, um, is non-zero. And then as I get closer and closer to the boundary of the Mandelbrot set, as I start to leave, that area is shrinking. And then there's a moment where there, where the set J is a continuous curve containing no area. And then as I leave the Mandelbrot set, as my C value leaves the Mandelbrot set, it shatters into dust. So this J, which is the set that is the boundary between these two basins, the basin of infinity and the basin of, of the sink, it's either completely connected, either containing area or not. If there's no area, it's on the boundary of the Mandelbrot set, um, or totally disconnected. Okay, so that's another weird thing about it. Um, I've said it a few times, but we'll write it down. J is connected if and only if the orbit of the origin is bounded. If the origin is unbounded, goes off to infinity, um, then J is this dust. And that would be the case you know, for any C value that's outside the boundary of the Mandelbrot set. Cool. Uh, one last thing. So J repels orbits. 
you can't iterate this map forward and get closer to J. It's got sources, it's got chaotic orbits, so, and it sits between white points that go to a sink, colored points that go off to infinity, so it's, um, in this picture, you're only able to resolve it as the boundary between those two, um, the boundary between those two types of behavior. You don't approach J. Cool. Questions about all this? All right, we're ready to, f to find the Mandelbrot set then. Um, so let's do that. The Mandelbrot set is, all right, it's the set that um, is defined to contain all values C, these constants C, such that the origin is not in the basin of infinity. for the map p sub c of z equals z squared plus c. So we're going to try and, you know, for every C value in this picture, you know, we started in iterating it by hand, we started at zero. The origin was bounded. It was a sink when, when C was zero. Um, and then, so, so M then, that C value of zero, if we think about, you know, building up what this M looks like, the origin is not in the basin of infinity for that, for the C value of zero. Because Z squared, um, if I add zero here, um, if I look at the Julia set for this map, it's on the board right now, the origin does not go to infinity. So the C value of zero is in the Mandelbrot set. And in fact, you know, little perturbations of it, I get the same, as long as everything stays nice and white, I get the same, you know, type of shape of this Julia set. The Julia set's showing me what points other than the origin do, also. It's showing me this whole plane. But the Mandelbrot set is concerning itself only with what the origin does. So all those perturbations that I'm doing, they're in this big lobe here. And there's a period one sink for all the points in this lobe. Um, so maybe now would probably be a good time to show some examples. That's not good. That's better. OK. So. So one of the exciting things about this Mandelbrot set, for which all the points in black are members of the set, all the points in blue, it is the case that the origin goes to infinity under that polynomial P. All right, so, so let's make some of these. This is code you have in, uh, it's on the web. Um, so here's, a, here's a, a, a drawing of it in MATLAB where um, the points outside of the Mandelbrot set, the C values for which the origin goes to infinity, they're just getting these sort of wavy colors to show you the rate at which, like how long it takes for them to leave a, a particular size ball. Um, okay, and then points in the set. So if I pick, you know, some point, the crosshairs are going to allow me to, to pick a particular point in the set. So if I pick one in this main ball here, um, what's going to happen, and I press return, it's going to draw the Julia set for that C value that I chose. Okay, which is what's happening in this, in this picture here is, um, you know, I've, I've basically picked a C value, you know, down here somewhere. So the Julia set's being drawn for that. And now what I'm going to do is pick a point in that Julia set, a white point, and see what, you know, what happens to it as I iterate it forward. Well, it, it spiraled in. Looks like there's a spiral sink, which means if I look at the Jacobian, it's going to have um, an imaginary eigenvalue with real part minus one, or a negative real part. Um, sm sm this is a map, smaller than one in magnitude. So it spiraled in to that sink. And in fact, if I chose any initial value in this black area that you see in here, the colors are getting inverted. So it's white in um, the website. It's black here. Any black point inside here, it goes, it would spiral into that, that same spot. Any point outside, headed out to infinity. So let's, 
let's see one that's headed out to infinity. Um, so I picked a point down, sort of down in here. Uh, so it's drawing the, and now I'm going to pick a point that's not inside the Julia set, or I'm going to try to. Oh, I missed. Okay, that was a black point. Let's try again. <clears throat> so this is the C value that I'm clicking on. It's going to draw the Julia set for that C value. I'll move away from the boundary. And it took off. So you may not have seen it, but it bounced. It, it, if I start really close to the boundary, the closer I start, the longer it'll take. But it eventually it works its way out and, and explodes. And the way the thing's being drawing this is it's, it's putting a little circle, maybe radius 10, around the origin and saying, how many iterates does it take for you to leave this circle? Because once you do, you're, it's, you're gone. And that's how these bands are being drawn. Questions about this so far? All right, so all... I've been saying this. All of the points in the, all of the C values in this big bulb lead to Julia sets for which the origin is attracted to a period one sink. If I move away from this bulb and I pick any of these other ones, they're an infinite collection of these bulbs. Um, if I move into this bulb, for example, it should be a period two sink. If I move into this bulb, it should be a period four sink, period eight. So I can, um, all of the black points in there represent C values for which. Uh, the origin approaches one of those. So I can pick one of those. That looks like it'll be period four. So I'm, the Julia set's going to be drawn. If I pick a black point in here, it, it should approach a period four sink if I've done it properly. So you see the little red? Maybe you can see them there for them. And any black point in this interior of the Julia set, J, will approach that same period four sink. If I perturb the C value um, you know, somewhere within here, I'll get an, a period for attracting set for any C value in there. If I pick a different bulb, I'll get a different integer. These are all different integers of the, <laughs> this is amazing. Each one of these is a different integer for which all of the points in the Julia set approach that, um, whatever that sink is. So, so if we, we try and try this again, um, so let me try like this bulb right here. It's going to draw the Julia set, and I'm guessing period five because of what these things look like. But now I'm going to come and I'm going to click on a point that I think is inside this interior. So that point was attracted to a period five sink, as is all the other, as are all the other points. And if I go back to the Mandelbrot set and perturb my C value anywhere inside that lobe, that'll produce Julia sets for which the attracting behavior is a period five sink. Slightly different pictures. Okay, this is amazing, right? This is a, <laughs> we're iterating this polynomial. It's just, you know, like, it's just this quadratic equation and you're adding a constant. And to give you a sense for how amazing it is, like, this boundary between the set, the points for which the origin's bounded and not, this is a very interesting boundary. You can zoom in on it, trying to main, stay close to this boundary, and what you find are an infinite collection of smaller little Mandelbrot sets. Okay, each of the, I'm going to pause it. Each of these black points represents a C value for which the origin's bounded, and there's some super high integer period that the Julia set points approach. And anywhere you look near the boundary of the Mandelbrot set, there are other little versions like this that have their own super high integer periods for which the origin approaches a sink of that period. Um, and this goes on, if you keep going, this is, a, this is sort of the canonical example of a, a fractal object. You don't ever you know, get to the point where things look nice and smooth. And you have you know, like a circle or a straight line. So this set, this Mandelbrot set, that is the, you know, it, it defines the points for which the origin is bounded. This is an incredibly complex set. And it comes out of this, just this single straightforward equation. All right? The Julia sets are all different. Um, you know, they're, they're all different maps of what that particular C value looks like. And then the Mandelbrot set is this meta collection of all of these C values that says, all right, for, for that C value, what does the origin do? Does it go to infinity or does it stay bounded? Um, so as much sort of rich behavior as you could imagine happening and plenty of things to explore. Um, 
I'm trying to think. Oh, yeah, one other thing I want to show you is, is what, what this picture looked like, the Mandelbrot set picture that we just, you know, like a computer can generate this, this zoom um, in, you know, like a couple minutes now. Back when this, pic when this video was made, it was um, quite a bit of computing power to do this, but uh, at this point it's, it's trivial. And, and yet when Mandelbrot first saw this picture, this is what it looked like. Check this out, ASCII. This is what it looked like. So he's, you know, he's picked a little grid and it's like, okay, 0 0.01. I'm gonna move around in little 0 0.01 increments in the, in the real and imaginary parts of C and I'm gonna ask, what does the origin do? So the asterisks, those are places for which the origin was bounded when he iterated that equation on the computer. And, um, and so this, yeah, this is such a cool picture. So this is what it first looked like. And all the bulbs, you know, that are, these are sort of missing and it doesn't resolve if you zoom in, it's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but each, you know, each one of these, each one of these little, uh, I, I posted this video, maybe we should watch it of Mandelbrot now. So, I, you know, each one of these is its own little universe and uh, that's pretty cool. So maybe we'll watch the, the video that I posted about this because it's good. The fact that was up, what was the origins of that? Because they felt they were beautiful. 
one of the one of my best known pieces of work uh, called the man that was set. It's a, it's a set with the ultra formula is so short that people think it's ridiculous. It's it's almost as simple as the formula itself. Formula can be very simple and create a universe of bottomless complexity. Amazing wealth of detail which is present there. It's just So he's a, a pretty interesting guy. Um, I tweeted a, um, a, a funny example of an, an argument that he got in with another um, academic. And uh, he was uh, particularly passionate about his ideas and thought pretty highly of um, their relevance. And you know, it's borne out that there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of fields now that have benefited from this, this idea um, of objects with fractional dimension and this, you know, this concept of roughness, as I've, I've said it. You know, it um, it makes a lot of sense when you're trying to think about many of the objects we see in the world. And you know, this idea of calculus is terrific, but it really wouldn't have worked to address a lot of these problems. So, so it's a really simple equation, but um, you know, it's, it's sort of an easier contact point for us to get into than a lot of the details of you know, where it's relevant. But um, you, know, you saw the picture of the dinosaur there. There's lots of examples now of um, animated and computer generated graphics that absolutely employ this type of mathematics for generating roughness that looks realistic on the, you know the surface of an ocean or you know in the background of you know some mountain range stuff like that um, so that's another another example and your phone has different frequencies the antenna needs to t talk to you know hardware at that are orders of magnitude apart and so having little you know smaller and smaller folded up um, fractional dimension antennae in your phone makes it possible to have, you know, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and you know the cell phone tower and all that stuff talk to your phone easily. Um, also, pretty cool. So, uh, so that's one example you're going to play around with in your homework. There's lots of others, obviously, lots of other fractal objects, and I, I'll mention one that is um, in in your book. There's a, an example of. Um, and this made the cover of Science News back in the 90s. This is my advisor, Jim York, uh, was involved in this work where this is an example of, of what's called a, a riddled basin. So th there are sets, attracting sets on these, um, these, this triangle on, on these curves that you can see. And I think there are six attractors if I'm, if I'm remembering this right. So yeah, so there are six total attractors and uh, the basins are colored. The basin of infinity is black, but the basins of each of the six attractors which live on this triangle, they're colored, you know, red and blue and green. And the basin is, you know, with the Mandelbrot set, at least, the, you know, there's this big dense region in the middle that things go to a sink, and there's a region on the outside, things go to infinity, the, you know, the origin does, and then there's this boundary that's interesting. So here, um, every single point, uh, if you put a little ball around it, has points of other colors in it. There's no region, as has been the case in a lot of the things we've, we've looked at. There's no, you know, in, for most of the fractals we looked at, you, you look at some region and, the, you know, all the points in that region do the same thing. They get the same color. And in this case, that's, that's not true anywhere. So you go and look at, a, no matter how far you zoom in, if I pinch, 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 you know, zoom in, zoom in, every single, there's never a region that's solid red or a region that's solid green. So every point has points nearby that do other things, which means there's no resolution if you're trying to decide what would happen here. There's no, there's no measurement resolution that would allow you to know. Every, every measurement is a little fuzzy ball, and that ball has um, points that go to any of these six attractors in it. Super cool. Riddled basin. Uh, any questions?
Okay. So we're going to now try and sort out some ways to measure the dimension. Um, we've said that these objects have non-integer dimension, and that's been sort of a weird, ambiguous place to stop. Um, but yeah, we're going to try and figure out how, how to measure these things. Um, I mentioned the concept with, uh, with this Mandelbrot set. I mentioned when he was trying to motivate this in this fractal geometry book, the idea of measuring the coastline of England and the fact that it would get longer as your measurement device uh, resolved. Cool. And that the quantifying the dimension is going to be about watching the rates at which those two things happen. The measurement device shrinking, the length getting longer, and the balance between those two. That's how we're going to quantify dimension, one, one of many ways. That's the easiest thing to do if you know what the set is. If you have data, it's harder. Um, but if you have a functional relationship, you can do that. So section 4.5 in your book is about measuring the fractal dimension of objects. There are a, a few different ways to do this. Uh, I can think of at least five, so it's kind of annoying. But we're going to start with the, uh, the easiest way to sort of understand how to do it. Um, it's not typically the way that people measure this in practice, but it's the way that we can at least write down and, and understand by hand before we, um, before we learn about how people do it in reality. So, um, so the ways this is going to work is basically... Uh, we're going to take a set that's of interest to us, and we're going to lay down a grid on top of it. So for example, the, an on-map attractor, if I wanted to measure its dimension, the thing that we're going to end up doing is laying a grid down and counting how many elements of, there's a thing we, like, we can absolutely do this, this is just counting, how many of the um, grid elements overlap with the set that we care about. So if I go over to the picture here, you know. Um, uh, it tells me in the caption, 76 of the boxes. One, two, three, four. I'm not going to count this box because it doesn't have any of the set in it. Five, six, seven, eight. You know, and if I, it looks like that one, nine, ten. I could count all the boxes, I'd get 76. So 76 of the boxes have the set in them uh, out of the 256 that are shown. And uh, okay, so that's, that's going to be a number that I keep track of. I can then cut the size of the boxes in half, which means I have four times as many boxes. But I won't have exactly four times as many. Um, I won't have four times 76 boxes containing part of the set. I'll have a different number. So that's what this looks like. Um, and then you can cut it again. And you can imagine continuing to do this. This will be called the box counting dimension. Easy way to visualize what's going on. Not typically what ends up happening in practice when you try and calculate what the dimension is, but there'll be other ways. But this is the idea. Does that make sense, what we're actually going to do? Yeah. So we'll do it just for a set that we, you know, we can actually we can write down. Um, so the, you know, the box counting dimension, we'll define it. Um, precisely in a minute, but the concept is, you know, how do the number of boxes, or how does how does the number of boxes necessary to cover a set how does it vary as the grid size is decreased? That's the question we're gonna we're gonna ask. So um, let's do let, let's do a square. Uh, let's do the square that is um, zero to two crossed with itself. So it's this little region right here. And we'll keep track, painstakingly, of how many boxes it takes. There'll be a nice little pattern. 
um, to cover this set. Cool. So we're going to do it in a little table. Uh, N will be the number of boxes. And the boxes are going to have a width, a side length epsilon. So N of epsilon is the number of boxes of side length epsilon. Epsilon is going to be getting smaller, n is going to be getting bigger. Um, cool. All right, number of boxes of size epsilon. Save some room for some other stuff. We'll do this first. So if I have, uh, let's think, how many boxes of side length 2 does it take to cover my set? One. Yeah, so if I take my side length epsilon to be 2, I just need one box. And if I cut it in half, how many boxes do I need if I cut the side length in half to 1? I need four. I don't need two because if I cut it in half, that since there's two dimensions, there's a, there's a, um, this thing's going up by a power. So I got a two to the zero here. I got a two to the two here. Um, cool. And if the side length were, if I did it again, how many would I need? Yeah, and what's the side length there? One half, two to the minus one, I need 16. What if I did it again? What would my side length be? A quarter, and I would need how many? Sixty-four. So these aren't going up in powers of two, they're going up in powers of four. Four to the zero, four to the one, four to the two, four to the three. Um, okay, so there's a pattern. And, uh, and in fact, what we're going to end up trying to do is keep track of this pattern. And because they're going up in powers, we're going to take the log of these numbers. And it doesn't really matter what base we use. Uh, it can be helpful to use a base that corresponds to the geometry of your shape. So here, since things are going up um, in powers related to 2, we'll use uh, the base 2 log. So, um, so we're looking at, at the log 2 of n. And the log 2 of epsilon, we're going to want to compare the rate at which n is going up and the rate at which epsilon is going down. So we're going to actually reciprocate epsilon. We're going to do 1 over epsilon. And then both things are going up. If we look at n, it's going up. The number of boxes required to cover my set, that's going up. If I look at epsilon, it's actually going down. It's getting smaller. But if I look at its reciprocal, that thing's going up also. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at log 2 of 1 over epsilon, which would be a half, 1, 2, 4, and so on. Yeah. All right, so um, 2 to the 0 is 1, and 2 to the 2 is 4, and 2 to the 4 is 16, and 2 to the 6 is 64. And if I look at the reciprocal of epsilon, I said that's a half, and the log of that is minus 1, um, 0, uh, log base 2 of 2 is 1, and 2, and so on. We're going to be doing this with weird shapes, but we're starting with a square so that we can understand the scaling idea and how it relates to the dimension of an object. So there are patterns here. We can write down what this is. This is going to be 4 over epsilon squared, this column. 4 um, in the numerator there is the area of the original object. Which won't actually matter to our dimension calculation. Like if I started instead with um, a square of side length 4, there would be a 16 there, but I'd still have the epsilon squared in the denominator. And that squared is important, the fact that there's a 2 there. 
that's going to say something about our dimension. Um, okay, this thing is complicated, but it's 2 times 1 plus the base 2 log of 1 over epsilon. And it won't matter which base we use for this procedure, but um, we chose 2 here because of the fact that it's a square and it's um, we're cutting in half. If we were cutting in a different, like if I were cutting it into thirds, I would maybe do the base 3 log, and it would make the math work out nicer. Yeah? Right. Good question. So, um, what am I trying to say? I must have a reference uh, that I'm picking to start with. So, one epsilon. Maybe I mean, maybe I mean which. What is epsilon? So. I will answer your question. Let me, let me finish this, and then I'll get back to it. So this is epsilon right here, this, this column. Um, and so this is defined in terms of this column. Um, and oh, wait, 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 no. You're totally right. This is wrong. This is epsilon. That's why. This is epsilon. And we're going to define this term in terms of epsilon. Good. So this is 2 times 1 plus log 2 of 1 over epsilon. Good eye. Epsilon is the side length. It's shrinking. What is the log base 2 of n? Well, that's going to have an epsilon in it. And then the last piece, uh, this is going to be just log 2 of 1 over epsilon, which I have in the header. So this is just repeating. That's kind of annoying. All right, so it's the relationship between these two things that I am going to look for to decide what the dimension is. Um, so we're going to plot them against each other. So we're going to plot um, log 2 of n as a function of log 2 of 1 over epsilon. How is this growing as a function of this? That's the idea. All right, so I guess my x starts at minus 1 with a value of 0. And when x is 0, y is 2. And when x is 1, y is 4. And when x is 2, y is 6. So my plot here, this on this axis, this is log 2 of n. And down here, this is log 2 of 1 over epsilon. And it's the slope of this line that tells me how these two quantities are changing with respect to each other. So as I shrink epsilon, 1 over epsilon grows, but it's growing slower than log base 2 of n, which is why this slope is bigger than 1. What's the slope of this line? Slope is 2. That's the dimension of a square. This is not news to you. But we've measured it using the box counting dimension. The slope of this line is 2. So that means that um, n of epsilon scales as 1 over epsilon squared. Now, the area that I started with, I, this, I have a 4 over here. The area that I start with doesn't really matter, like I was saying. I could start with a different area object to begin with. I could start with a circle to begin with. But I'd still get, with a circle, I'd still get this happening. I'd still get the epsilon squared in the denominator, like I do for a square. Or if I used a triangle or some other shape in two dimensions that had a boring boundary between itself and the outside world, I'd get a 2 in the denominator. 
Okay, when we do this same thing for, um, for the Anon map, we're going to get a different sequence of points. So we'll end up with, you know, like these pictures that I'm talking about. So we got 76 points containing the attractor here. So that would be, you know, I'd take the log of that. I was saying it doesn't matter what base I use. Um, I'd get some point on the curve for that box size. And then I'd cut the boxes in half, and I get an, another count. And then I cut the boxes in half, I get another count. And I get a, this collection of points, and in fact, they won't be on a line. They'll be kind of, you know, moving around a little bit. But I'll fit a line to it, and the slope of the line that I fit to it, that slope is the dimension of the an on map. And that's what we're going to do with these sets. We're going to put, it won't always be boxes. We'll put shapes down. They might, there'll be different shapes than boxes. We could use triangles if it made more sense. We could use circles if it made more sense. For the logist or for the middle thirds canter set, it will we'll just use these intervals of width a third and then a ninth and so on. Those will be our boxes in one dimension. Um, okay, so we can say something more general about this definition now. Now that we've decided very excitingly that a square is two dimensional. Um, a set S that is a subset of Rm is said to be d-dimensional if it can be covered by... Um, n of epsilon, number of boxes n of epsilon, equal to some constant divided by epsilon to the d. Constant doesn't matter. You can have a big object or a tiny one. That's the area. It doesn't matter. It's the scaling that'll happen. It shows up in the denominator. Um, n so, so n of epsilon boxes of side length epsilon. in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. So I put four dots on the picture, and we could have continued. And in the case of the square, I would get, this, I would get exactly the same geometric relationship every time. And that line actually interpolates every one of those points. It's exactly slope two. That's not going to happen for the objects that we study in this class typically. We're, we won't always get points that fall on all on the same line. That does happen for some of them that are um, where we have an equation for them. But for the non-map, it won't happen. So you'll get this because of lots of things. There's the numerical thing that happens. So as I start, like if I start making these boxes super, super tiny, at some point, I've iterated the non-map. Uh, you know, maybe I've done it 10,000 times. I get my nice picture. But there's only 10,000 points. No matter how tiny I make my boxes, I'm never going to get more than 10,000 boxes because I only iterated the map 10,000 times. So there's only 10,000 points for boxes to have inside them. And then this curve is just going to flatline because there's no more things to collect as I make my boxes smaller. So it would be bad if I counted all those, if I fit my line including all of those points. I'd get a different slope. This is a kind of a, uh, there's some things to pay attention to when we do this what I'm getting at, related to the resolution of this, um, your orbit of the attractor you're looking at. So C is, um, C is the constant. It can be as large as needed. Provided that the epsilon to the minus D scaling holds. as epsilon goes to zero. Here I'm checking, every, I'm checking very, epsilon very regularly. I'm doing powers of two. I don't have to do that. I could do powers of three. I could do powers of 10. I could do every you know, 0.1 or something like that. But in the, you know, we can't actually take the limit, is what I'm saying. On the computer, 
for these sets that we create by iterating a map, there's no, there's no, we don't have the ability to go to the limit as epsilon goes to zero for numerical reasons. But we can approximate it. Um, and d, importantly, uh, d need not be an integer. It is for this example with the square. But um, nothing about how we're going to end up calculating this will require that. Two, uh, you know, think about dimension, you know, one dimensional line. The, that, that one number, you think about it as a degree of freedom, it tells you where you are on that line. And in two dimensions, there's two numbers. There's a coordinate pair that tell you where to go. Surface of the Earth, latitude and longitude tells you where to go. Two degrees of freedom, two dimensional. Three dimensions, right? You know, like, okay, there's an altitude. Or you're in R3, it tells you where you are. It feels a little weird to have an object potentially that has non-integer degrees of freedom. There's something less happening then. There's a, you know, like if I'm thinking about in R2, a fractional dimensional object that is smaller than, then it's like I need less than two degrees of freedom to find it. So we'll try and get a little more comfortable with what that means in practice. Um, there's sort of you know an information theory way to think about it and how much how much is required to identify a point. Um, all right, so we're going to write down. What does this look like? I'm going to I'm going to rearrange this a bit, this equation right here. Um, if I want to figure out what the dimension d is, it doesn't help me to have this equation looking like this. So I can move my um, I can move my stuff around a little bit. And so I'm going to take a log, obviously, uh, to get the d down in front and away from the epsilon. Yeah. Um, right, and I plotted the logs against each other. So, so d, my definition of this dimension, is going to be natural log of n. And it has this ln of c sitting, on, sitting there because um, I'll need that for now. So you move this some stuff around, you get this relationship. And, and what it means then is that I'm, I'm using the natural log here, just um, the base, again, doesn't matter, uh, is this, this piece here, the constant c, in the limit as epsilon goes to 0, the things that are happening, um, as epsilon gets really small, n is going to infinity if it's a continuous set and it's not you know, some finite orbit like we, we, we could create on the computer. n's going to infinity. As epsilon goes to 0, this term's also going to infinity. So we got big stuff happening. c is a constant that's just the area, effectively, of the object we started with. And this will not matter in the limit as epsilon goes to 0, this last little piece here. Um, so uh, we'll write that down. In the limit. As epsilon goes to zero, uh, this ln of c term becomes negligible. <clears throat> and we'll say that a bounded, a bounded set um, S in Rn has box counting dimension BCD um, equal to the limit as epsilon goes to 0 of ln of n of epsilon natural log of the number of boxes of size epsilon divided by the natural log of 1 over epsilon where epsilon is the size of the box. So this is the rise over the run in our picture, the picture that we plotted for uh, for our square had as its run it had the ln of one over epsilon and or the nat the log base two of one over epsilon and uh, the log of the number on the y axis. So rise over run we measured the slope we said okay that's two that's what we're doing here we're measuring that slope in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. In practice. We don't often, we're not often able to do it for epsilon goes to zero. We have a sequence of points, maybe five, six, seven points. 
as the box size gets smaller, and then we fit a line to those, and that's our, our estimate of the dimension. And we'll do that for the sets that we've been talking about. Yeah? What does ACD stand for? Box counting dimension. Uh, I said there are lots of ways to measure the dimension of an object. This is one of them. There will be others that we'll talk about. This is the easiest one to write down and explain and see pictures of. Um, but it won't make sense for, like for example, if, there are, uh, if the data is very high dimensional, like each one of these points is a one dimensional, um, I guess in each one of the points here is in R2. But if we, our original set of data was in R10 or R20, it actually starts to be really hard to decide if the points are in boxes of that dimension because there's so many more boxes, the boxes get, like the number of boxes to count explodes as the dimension goes up. So we'll end up doing other things than this box counting dimension in those, um, in those cases. All right, uh, I didn't write this down. Box counting dimension is this thing if the limit exists. So we could make, we, we could make weird mathematical shapes for which um, you know, this thing isn't a nice, a nice line, that it does other things. You know, it could curve away in that, um, even in the limit, and that would make it harder. So, uh, okay, so other things to say. We don't actually have to check the boxes at regular intervals. We don't have to use boxes. So some simplifications. Uh, OK. The limit as epsilon goes to 0 um, need only be checked at discrete points along the way. That's one simplification. The boxes don't need to sit on a grid. They did in our particular square case because that made sense, but they don't have to. They could be rotated too. Um, you can arrange them as, as you like, and then sets other than boxes are fine. And boxes, you know, that's like the higher dimensional version of an interval. So we could use intervals or we could use other shapes. Um, sets other than boxes are fine. Triangles, disks. Uh, cool. Questions? So let's do this for the middle thirds canner set. Um, K infinity, we got by taking the unit interval, we removed the middle third, we had this, these two intervals remaining, then we removed the middle thirds of those, and so on. We said some things about this set, which is weird. The set is uncountable, because I can write down a bunch of internary uh, elements with zeros and twos that never repeat. Those points are in K infinity, but they're uncountable collection of them. Yet, it is measure zero. It doesn't take up any space. Okay, we're going to try and decide what its dimension is. According to our formula. Uh, all right, here's our formula right here. I'd like to cover the set. And fortunately, this is, this is a very nice formula for our example because we have our boxes are just these intervals. And we need one interval of length one to start. And then we need two intervals of length a third. And then we need four intervals of length a ninth. Yeah? So, in fact, um, because, so here's a single interval of length one, and then two intervals of length a third, four of length a ninth, eight of length a 27th. And in my procedure, as epsilon goes to zero, if I'm thinking about count, you know, I'm covering the set with these intervals that are getting smaller and smaller, 
that's exactly this, this definition. Limit as epsilon goes to zero. So my boxes in this case are just intervals who, you know, that are size three to the minus um, n, where you know, that's my epsilon, my box size. OK, so this is k0, k1, k2, k3, and so on. Um, all right, so we have 2 to the n boxes at step n, 2 to the n boxes. Um, and their length is 3 to the minus n. That was sort of the first thing we wrote down about k infinity. So those numbers go into our formula. Um, so let's do that here. So we have the limit as epsilon goes to zero. Uh, ln of natural log, or the natural log of n of epsilon. So that's ln of two to the n divided by natural log of 1 over the side length. Epsilon is 3 to the minus n. So that's ln of, and I'm just going to, because I have it in the denominator here, 1 over 3 to the minus n is just 3 to the n. And in fact, I'm getting rid of my epsilon goes to 0 because n's going to infinity and doing the same thing. So my box counting dimension for the, for the uh, middle thirds canter set, I have these intervals. There, I'm getting twice as many each time. They're shrinking by a factor of 3 each time. If I bring the n's down in front, which the log rules let me do, they disappear. So this is, uh, this is just ln of 2 over ln of 3. Which is not 1. And it's not 0, and it's not 2 thirds. Oh, I have it. All right, it's, it's, a ba it's about, this is about uh, 0.63 and change. So we have this dust. It's weird. There's an uncountable collection of it, which should take up space. It does not, because that was the pathological discovery of Cantor. But it does have a dimension. It's not zero dimensional. If I just look at um, you know, some finite collection of points from R1, that's zero dimensional. If I look at an interval, that's one dimensional. If some, something with measure is going to be one dimensional. And this is in between. Questions? OK. So that's an example. We'll do one more. Oh, we'll do this in on-map example. So now this set is obviously more complicated than the middle thirds canter set. Um, the Hinan attractor, remember, is, is not an object that you ever see exactly. What you see are points that are approaching it. If we think about what an attractor is. Um, because this orbit is chaotic, it is tracing out and visiting closely as often as you'd like effectively as you go to infinity in, in number of iterates, and as close as you'd like, tracing out something called this chaotic attractor, which we'll define more rigorously later. But any chaotic orbit will, you know, of the non-map will do this sort of shape, but it's, they're all different. They're all a little bit different. They're all sort of getting close to the backbone that is this Attractor. So that's the thing we're trying to measure the dimension of, where we put this grid down and we count the boxes. We got 76 boxes out of the 256. And then the next, um, let's see, what, what do we got here? On the left, epsilon's an eighth, 177 boxes. I'll save you the trouble of counting them all. 177 boxes here um, out of the how many would there be? Let's see. So I've 256 up here, that's, uh, I'm going to need to multiply that by 4. 1,024 boxes in this picture, and um, 177 of them have the set in them. Okay? And then I'm multiplying again by 4. So 4,097 uh, 
Six. Okay. Four thousand. Thank you. Four thousand ninety-six boxes here. You can see them all with our eyes. And then, uh, and then. Okay. So we count how many? Four hundred thirty-three of those boxes have then mon and on map in them. So we do this. Repeat it. No, I'm not counting them. The computer will count them. There's a piece of code on the web. Boxcount.m. It does this for you. So you don't have to do them by hand. You'll be making, you know, making shapes that are interesting and, and finding their dimension the way in ways that we're describing. Um, I think I have. All right, so here's what that table looks like. The table we just filled out for um, looks like the LaTeX needs some work. <laughs> so for for this, so I'm taking the base two log of these numbers. I get these fractions, side length. And then I plot those against each other. And I get a straight line fit of the data. They're not on a line. 6.3 a quarter and 7.5 and 8 are not, well, those two are on a line. And the next one, 8.8 .8 and uh, a 16th, those are not on the same line. All right, so you fit, there's, you know, this is a least squares thing, linear algebra, hurrah. You fit a set of points with a line. Very nice math problem. And, uh, and you, get, you get a slope and an intercept that is the best fit for that line, given the data you have. And that, the slope of that line is the dimension of the non-map attractor. All right, so when we do it, what do we get? Uh, 1.27. That's bigger than 1 and smaller than 2. If it were a, you know, just a, like if I, if we just, like if I put my pencil down and drew this sort of sickle-shaped thing and we did the business, we'd get 1. Or if I enclosed some area with my curve, I made a blob, and we did this, we'd get two for the slope. So there's more happening here, because as we zoom in on that shape, it turns out that it's neither of the two things I just talked about. It's, you know, you start to see more and more boundary. Okay, so it's not just a one-dimensional curve that I've drawn, but like every time I zoom in on well, some part of it, it looks like more and more of those little one-dimensional curves. But there's not enough of them collectively to take up space. All right, so we'll have some math things to say about, uh, so this is the BCD. We'll have some math things to say about what it means to have a dimension smaller than the space you live in, about, you know, like whether or not, what that means about whether or not there's any measure associated with that set. Um, Basically, any time your set has a dimension smaller than the space it comes from, it's a measure zero object in that space. It doesn't take up any volume. We'll talk about that next time.